Hello, Juliana. Hello, Anna. How are you? Yeah, yeah, you know, one day at a time. So, um, obviously, Juliana is a specialist therapist, teacher, author, public speaker, fundraiser, founder of therapies for special needs and rainbow kids, touch therapy. And her son, Oliver, oh, wrote such a, an amazing poem. And um, he he was just so fantastic on Autumn's Got Talent in St. Ives. And as I said, um, Juliana writes for us now every week. So And she, she's such a lovely lady. So over to you, Juliana. Off you go. Thank you, Anna. I'm going to start with something a little bit unusual um, because, well, I'll just get on and read it. It's a six lines. That's all it is. And, and I'll explain what it means when I've read it. I'll leave the big goggles for this bit. So it's called The Fly. I am the fume that lives in your clothes. I am an irritation of love beneath your skin. I come in swarms like a flock of birds. A mist to your eyes, you see a plague of love in me. I am a grain of the dark sky scattered on the stars. Within you is the fly. And the reason I wanted to read that is because that was written by my son Oliver when he went into class one day. He was only 13 at the time. And he was asked, write a love poem to a fly. And being autistic, having that surprise kind of put on him, and to produce those six powerful lines. Um, for a child who didn't speak until they were three, we wondered if he ever would, it was quite phenomenal. So for, I just wanted to give a little bit of background because it explains my journey and my work because there's all this big long list of stuff I do, but really it begins and ends with Ollie. You know, I'm a mum to Ollie, you know, like we were discussing before. And it's that walking of the journey from the inside out that helps you empathize and with other families and I often find when I work with children and young adults I, I work with the whole family which is why it's so special for me to be here today but the reason I began with the poem is because Oliver was actually that was his survival that was his life raft through school was his writing they were his words books were his friends he didn't have any social interaction at all he couldn't he couldn't read people he couldn't recognize social cues he just he couldn't do it so he, he was very bullied throughout school um so being in gifted and talented for english was his life raft you know it was like that was his way off of this titanic of his academic life you know and the world around him um however when he joined um a, a college at 13 because he's autistic with no warning at all they literally dropped him to bottom set english and his world crashed, his present was taken away and his future was taken away because they removed English literature. And at the time there was a higher and lower English paper. So he was only allowed to do the lower. So his dreams of doing English at university were removed. In a nutshell, because I've got to make this, I've got so much I want to share practically. So I'm, I'm kind of really boiling this down to just a few little, like a potted history. Um, we were also, unfortunately, um, going through domestic abuse that was off the scale. But very luckily for us, there was a huge blessing because my ex-husband was away an awful lot. So when we got the diagnosis for Ollie being autistic, I was told to get on with it and have a solution by the time my ex-husband got back. So I was off. I was off. That was all the permission I needed. So every time we were on our own, I would take Oliver to literary festivals, I'd write letters to authors, and all of them wrote back. Ollie would laminate postcards from different authors. I even had one lovely author, Beth Webb, come to our home. I bribed her with carrot cake and she sat with Ollie and gave him lots of tips for writing. So I did all those things around it and I wouldn't take no for an answer. And when Ollie came to do his, he actually got his, um, I began my work during this time, because when Ollie's present and future were removed, he actually then picked up additional mental health issues. So 75% of mental illness is laid down before the age of 14. And for our children who are born with higher 
stress hormones, higher stress levels naturally, they're two to six times more likely in adolescents to pick up an extra mental health issue. So for my son, it was chronic and debilitating OCD. He was being tested for psychosis. And although he, he, didn't ha he wasn't psychotic, he had symptoms of psychosis. And apparently there's a difference. So he was seeing nooses everywhere, um, strong, intrusive thoughts telling him to take his own life. It was a really, really low period. And at that point, in addition to taking him to the literary festivals, I um, began my work. So I'd always been a therapist, but it was then that I began to really adapt it and make it what it is now, which is meeting each unique person where they are and not where I want them to be. He's been my biggest teacher, which is why I say it begins and ends with Ollie. Actually, it begins with Ollie, but throughout my journey, it's actually, it's, well, it hasn't ended. It, I feel like it's just begun really in many ways, even though it's been a decade. Um, it's actually now about all the kids, all the young adults, all the families. And I've, we both, Ollie and I, use our life cards to kind of, prevent people going through that same heartbreak to give them tips one tip for instance i would go into schools with little postcards of ollie on inset days with ollie's photograph so even a supply teacher we could be kept in the register they knew who knew who he was a little bit about autism and ollie's challenges but then on the back all the positives and all the strengths anyway we got to a level and i'd been massaging him throughout doing other therapies as well to tremendous benefit which i'm going to explain just in a minute and um i fought for ollie just to let parents know out there any child is allowed to do an exam anywhere they choose so long as there's an invigilator and the examiner so for my ollie he did them in my therapy chalet and it was all checked beforehand. About eight people came to check it. And because he has autism, I had to fight. I took a Senko to a doctor's meeting. And um, we, we were very begrudgingly given seven minutes extra time. Again, parents out there don't accept this. Um, I actually went into the school because nothing's given to you on a plate. It's like you're this mad little archaeologist having to dig up all this help and research, you know. And I learned as I went with Ollie. And we discovered that, yes, you can do your exams anywhere you want. So I went back into the school and I said, as you've legally spent, and they didn't do anything wrong, as you've legally spent the funding I fought so hard to get for Ollie elsewhere, I really do feel in this circumstance the right thing to do, the ethical thing to do, is to let him sit his exams where he wants. He's allowed to. It's a basic human right. So they allowed him to and he got his 11 GCSEs. He had, to, he had to do math the second time. But obviously, because he didn't have English, he couldn't do A-level. So he did media studies, because you don't need English GCSE for that, um, art and drama. And to cut a big, long story short, he got a degree, a really good degree, from his first choice university in publishing and creative writing. And in September, he will complete, I've got goose pimples, in September, he will complete his master's in creative writing, which will make him more qualified than the eight teachers who sat in a room with me that day and said, Juliana, you've got to accept your son will never achieve because he's autistic. So please, parents, you know, don't take no for an answer. Believe in your child. There is a place for professionals. Of course there is. But if I can say to you now, when Ollie was going through his mental health issues and it was really, really chronic and he wanted to take his own life, he tried to drown himself twice in the bath. I only found that out later. It was an absolutely horrific black, black time. And the um, Ollie was so ill that the um, Dr. Clive North, the um, head of psychology in an outpatients unit, had to come to our home to visit Ollie. And when he signed Ollie off, he actually shook Oliver's hand and he said, you are such a bright young man, totally disabled by the mainstream system. And then he held, he actually held my hand and he said, you and your boy have turned all my textbook training on its head. And he said, from now on, whenever I get a child with autism in front of me, I will look at them differently. And so I think Ollie and I, in a really weird way, were meant to go through all that heartbreak. And Ollie now advocates for him, as he did his first time advocating, was with you, Anna, at Autism's Got Talent. And that moment for me 
I felt prouder than when he was um, when he, when I went to his degree ceremony. I, I sobbed. I sobbed at that one because I thought I've advocated for him all his life. I've made so many mistakes, but I've also learned so many positive things that I can now bring to others. And when I stood in the wings on the stage that day, last October, I just felt so proud at this brilliant young man who happens to have autism amongst all his other gifts and traits, advocating for the first time for himself and for others. And it was the proudest moment, you know, it's like I've handed that mantle over to him and he was standing next to me. So as I touched on briefly, and interrupt me if you need to, um, the reason I have found touch so incredible is A, because I win that person's trust, and actually the things I'm going to demonstrate with you today, I haven't got anybody to demonstrate on, and there's a reason for that, because some people don't like touch, and one of the ways I get around that is to either get them to mirror me, and most importantly, with every child, even those who will take touch from me, and adults, by the way, I'm saying child, I work with lots of young adults too, I work with people who are in their 50s who are autistic, you know, it's not just children. I mean, obviously I have my work in schools, but outside of that, it's all ages, um, all budgets, all, all abilities. Um, but for me, the key is always empowering that child or that young adult and their families. Because somebody earlier mentioned, you know, that it's like they drop off a cliff and invisible after 25. I found for Ollie, because Ollie's 22 now, I found that it, he dropped off the cliff at 13, to be quite honest, but it was really 16. You know, that was where it really became a fight to get all the extra funding. So um, what I'm going to, I'm sorry, I must get back on track. So what I want to share with you is what I share with people who come to all my sessions with their families and it's, they can either mirror the touch or do it on themselves which is incredibly empowering and it actually leads to self-awareness, self-regulation um, and self-management. Any good therapist should never make anybody dependent on them. That's just in my opinion. So for me, I sh I'm always talking myself out of a job all the time and I love that because there's so many people who, who need me and people like me, like us, that I'm really happy with that. And the door's always open, they can come back. But um, what I, the reason I particularly like to share touch with families um, when their kids come and young adults come is because not, not only is it very empowering to that family, and I'll go into the scientific research behind touch in a minute, but because for many parents, and this was myself included, and I had four children, have four children, um, when you spend so much time fighting, 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 until you feel flogged, you know, exhausted, it's a proven fact that parents of autistic children have exhaustion levels the equivalent of soldiers back from the front line, it's proven. And we are in that permanent state of fight or flight, so are our children, because they're born with those naturally higher cortisol levels. So everything feels like a fight. So when I have my lovely family workshops, um, when they actually touch each other, whether it's using a story, a song, or just mirroring me, whatever it is, because I meet them where they're at, so I flow, you know, it's never, I don't have anything rehearsed. I know my stuff, and I will meet the family where they're at. That's so key because you earn their trust too. And I had one man, oh gosh, this is just one example. He had, had an eight year old with, who's autistic and has ADHD actually. And he broke down when I was working with a family and he'd only been, he'd have done a, ten, a six minute little thing, little bit of touch on his child's back actually. We were lying on the floor and he was doing it on his child's back. And he broke down in front of other people. And he said, do you know, since I can't say the child's name, X was two, um, it's just been a continual fight. And I felt so out of my debt. And all I've heard from professionals is he can't, he won't be able to do this. You know, other people were defining him. And to just lie down on rugs 
and have that touch with his son, he said, I actually feel I've got my bond back with my son just to touch because, just to touch from love and not because I'm trying to get him to do things or get him to do other things for other people. You know, and, and when I have my workshops, I'm really big on reconnecting back and also sharing it with siblings because very often siblings, because there's so much focus on one child, like you were saying earlier, Anna, it's that juggle. My oldest son is very dyslexic. And I remember, um, just to put it in perspective, I watched a film called Wonder with Julia Roberts. I don't know if you've ever watched it. And she has a child with um, facial disfigurements and, and various other invisible disabilities, different abilities. And the, his older sister, meets a boyfriend and pretends I'm going right off course for my talk I always do this um, but it's so accessible this message and in a nutshell the daughter the older daughter met a boyfriend and made out she was an only child and it's funny because throughout this film I've really felt the mum and her battles and her fear and her absolute anxiety when she dropped her son off for his, his first day at school I felt all of that but for some reason I couldn't cry. I've kind of taught myself not to really. Um, but there was one scene where the mum gets, wants to spend some time with the daughter. And again, she gets called into the school because of the son. And when she gets back, she apologizes to the daughter, but her boyfriend has turned up. And the boyfriend said, I didn't know you had a brother. And afterwards the mum asked the girl, you know, why did you make out you were an only child? And she said, because I'm me because I felt like me and all my life, all the attention has been on, on my brother and not on me. And I turned to my daughter and I said to her, and this is quite, I used to be quite emotional and I wasn't planning on saying this. Um, I said to my daughter, have any of you other three felt like this? You know, when I was really up against it with Ollie and she just looked at me and just in, in, in four words, she just, I just broke down. She said to me, mum, we all understood. And so when I use touch with any young person, young adult, anybody, I love to include the family and the siblings because to me, it brings them all back to that level playing field and that touch. Um, and also by sharing the touch, they've got, it's a bit of an overused expression really. I, I'm not very keen on it, but the whole family, have a set of tools in the toolbox that they can use with each other when they get stressed with the person who has autism. So it's extremely inclusive and that's how I absolutely love to work. So am I all right, Anna, to go straight into? Yes, the please, please do. I, did, I didn't know if there were any questions or anything or if I'm babbling too much and not letting anyone get a word in edgeways. <laughs> not at all, not at all. We've just got some lovely comments of people who are agreeing with what you're saying. And we've got, I think, probably a friend of yours, Lucy, who's on Brian Bray's um, machine at the moment, saying, oh. uh, saying that she's enjoying uh, your talk. And um, I, I don't know, um, Lucy, do you want to say anything? She doesn't want to, she hasn't unmuted so you're, you're more than welcome, but basically, yeah, so what, what did she say? Let's have a look. Uh, Juliana, that's amazing. Well done to you and Ollie. It's Lucy here from Brian's laptop. Uh, she oh. couldn't work out Zoom. But, Hello! I know, uh, technology, I've had to learn. Hello! Oh, here she is, here she is. She is. For me and now it's an app. But she, she, she's free to talk now. Go ahead, Lucy. I'm trying to understand it. Yeah, I thought that was brilliant because I've always used writing as a way to figure out the world. When I was eight, I started writing and I was talking to my daughter about it yesterday and saying that my teacher at school told my mother I was retarded because they oh. used that then. Oh because God. it was the 70s. I'm, I'm probably, you know, I'm, I'm 49 now. And I sat there and my mum said, oh, you can't talk like that in front of her. And the teacher said, just think of it like she's got no intelligence. She's... You what? know, it's, oh it's like I'm God. sleeping in front of an inanimate object. She can't hear me. Oh, my goodness. And my mum said, well, that's not true because she talks fine at home. And yeah. I didn't even realise I was selectively. But the teacher thought I couldn't speak, you see, because I didn't. All I used to do at school was wail and flap my bunches. I had little bunches. I used to flap did, them. Did they not see that you were writing? Because speech is only 80% of communication anyway. 
Could they not they, see what you were writing? They didn't believe my mum. It, it was the classic story. My mum went in with the poems that I'd written and oh. I wrote, it's quite sad thinking about it, I wrote one about a swallow and it said if I could fly, I'd never rest. I'd fly and fly. And oh um, she took it in and showed it to them and they said she couldn't have written this. And they basically accused my mum of, my mum's got mental health issues, she's got quite severe mental health issues. So obviously we went down that road of them saying to my mum, well, you know, she couldn't have written this. She That's can't exactly. even hold a pen. All she does is fall is scream and hit herself. <laughs> and um, oh, oh. my teacher used to hit me. Because they were pretty then. So she used to slap yeah. me and I wouldn't do things. But the funniest thing is I went there for a, a meeting about one of my other children years later to the same primary school that my children were in. And I recognised the desk that I used to hide under. Oh my God. And they still had it there. And it was quite funny. I used to spend a lot of time sitting under this desk where I felt safe. And seeing it again, I thought, well, the desk is still here. And I've gone on to, I ended up, um, well, like Ollie, I decided to apply to Oxford. <gasps> and everybody was, Good for you. Yeah, everybody just laughed at me. So I went to Oxford and um, graduated in philosophy and theology. Yes. Hey. Oh my God, I and, love you. <laughs> and then I came back to Plymouth and did my teacher training, but I had no diagnosis. I'd never been diagnosed with anything. I got my mm, diagnosis. Phenomenal. Them. Funnily enough, the same primary school that I had gone to reported me for Munchausen's by proxy to the local authority, so that I was pretending my children had special needs. Oh my God. Unfortunately, by coincidence, when I was doing my PGCE, because I decided to take up teaching, I did my PGCE and they allocated me this dissertation subject of special needs because they oh. said you're from a privileged background because you went to Oxford, so you need to learn about special needs. Oh, so, wow. <laughs> wow. You can't make it up, can you? You couldn't make it up, no. Make so it up. When I went into the school, they said, okay, well, your dissertation was on special needs. Because I'd said to them, look, I'm a qualified teacher myself, so I know what I'm talking about. Exactly. So um, they'd actually said, well, you know, you're obsessed with special needs. That's why you're pretending your children have them. Oh, my God. <laughs> why did you want to pretend that it's hard enough when it's it, real? <laughs> it's just to get my baby oh, away. My and um, as a result, I got diagnosed with Asperger's and level two autism, which I thought was quite an interesting diagnosis. Yeah. So in a nutshell, I, I think what you've done is amazing. And I can, I can totally relate because obviously I knew I had to go to university just, just to prove people wrong, really. Good for you. That's how we are. It's like if somebody says yeah. no or can't, it's like a blooming big red, it's like a red tablecloth to a bull, not even just yeah. a flag. <laughs> Well, I've got dyspraxia as well, which I didn't get diagnosed with till I was 42. So I got diagnosed with autism at 41, dyspraxia at 42. Wow. And um, that explains why it took me 12 years to learn to drive. Yes. But I, I didn't give up. I just kept saving yes. up, taking more lessons and just, and um, I, I just passed my test and have, you know, managed ever since. Because I, I just, I'm one of those people, if you tell me I can't do something... It, it winds me up. And I think that's a very autistic trait, which, again, is a blessing, really. But isn't it a blessing? And things like tenacity, being industrious, never taking no for an answer. You know, in our lives, we never just go through the front door, as I've said previously. You know, we have to climb through windows, scale roofs, dig tunnels under buildings, you know. And, and it teaches you life skills. It teaches you determination, strength, belief. You know, and like you say, prove people wrong because our brains may be wired differently, but goodness me, you know, look at the amazing life skills we've had to learn, which an A to B person doesn't necessarily have. And actually, a lot of the kids I work with have phenomenal gifts. And once I go in with the touch and I build their trust, I earn their trust and we work together. I'm never working on them. I'm working with them and you work with their families and you bring that real positive belief, positive mm. hope. And, and the whole story is different. The whole story is different, you yeah. know, and, and, and they have gifts. These kids have gifts. And, and when you ease those challenges and issues, you find them. And even if it's not somebody who's ever going to be able to go into the workplace, there will be something that lights them up. And I use everything I can in my power to find that. You know, you, yeah. I never give up on anyone because I know what it felt like for people to give up on my son. So it's fantastic knowing there are people like you in the world. And it just yeah. makes me 
it, you, people like you, drive me to, to know that even more, I've only just begun my work, even though it's been a decade, and, and you fill me with energy even more, God help us all, motivation and, and just that inspiration to do more and fight more. And particularly as these kids, because autistic kids become autistic adults. So you just drive me to, to keep doing what I'm doing, but doing it better, if that makes sense. Oh, that's lovely. Thank you. Have you heard of Pygmalion syndrome? Pygmalion syndrome. No. Yes. I only found out about it today, actually. I was reading an article on the medium. Um, it's where if you tell teachers that these children are exceptionally gifted, they did IQ tests on children and then picked some at random and told the teachers that these children were very gifted and they must try and bring out their potential. By the end of the year, the teachers had focused so much on those children that they'd actually increased their IQs when they read wow. it. Now, it's isn't that interesting? And it's what you get, what you, what you encourage. The, exactly the behaviour you look what for. What we tell our children is what they become. And yes. that's very true because we touch. Now, now this is really interesting. Um, we don't just contain memory in our heads. We've, our, our cells, we have like something ridiculous, like 37.2 trillion cells that flow around the body and those cells carry memory. So what I mean by that, and also our water carries memory. Can you believe that? Yep. And most adults, it's, we're around 75% water and children, it's in the nineties. So our cells and our water carry memory. So when we get these repeated messages of you're no good, um, you don't fit in, you're, you're not valid, you, you know, you're not worth spending the funding on, you're naughty, you're behavioural. All these negative messages, including from professionals, sadly, in some cases, and there's many wonderful professionals out there too, obviously, that's what these children actually believe. That memory is carried through all their cells. It's, yeah. It actually goes in on that hard drive cellular level and people like professor rick hansen professor of neuroscience has now proved that what fires the brain wires the brain and and it is this thing of what we tell our children who are like wet cement is what they become so when a child and this is why i love what i do it's a proven fact that when a child is in a relaxed state, which is what they are, hopefully, when they're coming to me for all these different therapies, even though I never use the word therapy with them because it feels like a barrier to me, I'm flowing with them, that's what I do. Um, you know, four to six times of getting that touch, that safe, nurturing touch that fires up all the happy hormones and coping chemicals, four to six times of that, or four to six times of receiving a positive message about themselves, it actually, the little dendrites on the end of the nerves begin to unattach and then reattach. So you are actually rewiring the brain. That is how amazing it is. And, and that's not just through touch, that's through sound, through positive therapy games, you know, through meditation, through... Um, mindfulness gratitude if you think of three positive things a day you actually after six days your brain begins to rewire itself so i've done so much research into so many therapies about this but that's how powerful our minds are you know they really are and that's why yours lucy is amazing and ollie's is because yeah. you fought through continual negative messages you know, and, and you proved people wrong. And I honestly believe we were meant to go through our journeys to bring this message to people. I was yeah. terrible at science. I actually made my science teacher cry when I was 15. And poor Mr. Matthews, I don't know if he was just having a bad day and I was the last thing that tipped him over the edge or if it was all me. <laughs> but uh, it just blows me away now to think, I go around talking about things like neuroscience and I've done all these courses because, you know, Everybody has a gift. Everybody. I can't stress it enough. And please, if you take anything away from what I've said today, today, if you take anything away, please remember that, you know, what we tell our children is what they become. And whether you're a teacher, a doctor, a parent, a professional, you know, please remember that, you know, this is going into our children on a cellular level. So be 
be that one adult who believes in a child because I, I've, I always see life as a path and I'm actually really, really, really blessed and grateful for my life, even though it's been quite a crazy life. And I'm glad not a single pebble was changed because I've used those life cards, hopefully, to, to, to really properly help people. And so has Ollie and so have people like you, Lucy. But for many people, they don't know how to fight. Parents are beaten and battered down to believe their children are retarded. I can't believe that word was used. Just yep. blows me away. You know, this is shocking. So if you take anything away from me today, take this. Be that one person who, that one pebble on that path, that one piece of a child's pathway to change their future. You know, and, and with touch, and the therapies I do, you know, I'm going in not only on this cellular level, but this hormonal level of happy hormones, coping chemicals. I mean, I, I haven't got time to break it all down and go into the science of it. But even on the head, when you just gently mask, anybody can do, you know, the shampooing thing with just the pads of your fingers all over the head. When you work on the temples, you're on the capital city of the four main happy hormones and coping chemicals you know oxytocin love and nurture serotonin happiness self-esteem how massive is that um confidence dopamine it, the hormone of productivity motivation concentration focus pleasure and then you've got endorphins which again is that surge of feeling really good able to cope and function and pain relief so when you work on the temples you're massively, massively there because three of those four are produced there. And actually, um, oh gosh, when you, anything on the face, just because I really want to give you some practical things as families to do, any work you do on the face, so temples, over the eyes like this, I hope you can see me all right. I've put the iPad on books because I'm a bit tiny. Um, anything like this, you're actually working on the gut now that's amazing, isn't it? So if you've got a child who doesn't like their back being touched, anything on the face, you're working on the gut. The reason being, all of the meridians, beginnings and endings of the meridians down to the gut, the second brain, the enteric brain, um, Dr. Michael Gershon is the leading researcher in the field. So again, it's, it's completely scientific, proven. Um, the gut is where meltdowns come from. It's where we store anxiety, fear, trepidation dread but also excitement so any work we do on the face which we can self-administer or you can share on a family and friends basis i hope it's okay to mention i do actually have a youtube channel called rainbow kids touch therapy and if you go on that i've got lots of videos that actually help people because it was lockdown and i couldn't get my hands on people i wasn't allowed to work i've got tons on there for ocd anxiety autism, ADHD, things to do within families, things to do on yourselves. And all of it is very, very empowering. So that's a big thing I learned in lockdown. And I'm going to continue sharing in this way because it's just a joy to share. But going back to the second brain, it's, it's not just about what we digest, meaning food. It's also about what we don't digest. So meaning trauma. Um, and a lot of our kids have gone through trauma. A traumatic birth for instance you know um trauma yourself laura uh, lucy you know sitting underneath the desk because that was your safe place yeah. you were in continual fight or flight and our kids have got double the amount of cortisol bombing around their bodies as um neurotypical whatever that is normal i, ca I can't bear all these labels you know have so the minute you touch somebody Within 40 seconds, you're releasing oxytocin. When you boost the serotonin, the happiness hormone, you then have enough to make melatonin because melatonin, sleep, mood and aggression, the hormone that deals with that, um, is only made if there's enough serotonin. Well, for a lot of our kids, they've used up their daily quota of serotonin by eight o'clock in the morning. Or if they've been up all night, it's gone by two in the morning, three in the morning. So when you go in touch or positive messages or a meditation or a bit of mindfulness 
keep giving them those positive messages, you start to reprogram the cells with all the happy hormones and coping chemicals. They start to make enough melatonin to help them sleep. And you can physically boost the areas for melatonin here and here. Just by gently massaging with your, just with, just with your fingers. And if, if you can get the person to mirror you, they get the pressure that's right for them. They're in charge of it. And they can top themselves up all the time in between seeing therapists or, or being worked on. You know, so for some kids, they may not like that. But the reason I've mentioned the second brain and working on the face, so anything under the face, under the eyes like this, just rotate with your middle finger, middle finger pressure up to the temples. Anything around the eyes, you're directly working on the stomach. So eating disorders, you know, um, people who are in fight or flight, people who have buried dread they're continually living on some level of one to ten of fear you know all of these things because what we have in a nutshell is something called a gut brain axis therapists will know it as the polyvagal theory but it's where the first brain talks to our second brain which is the gut so if you imagine it in really really simple terms as a telephone wire between the two and it passes through the heart and goes round. And, and the heart is where we are. That's the control mechanism to health. That's how we feel. You know, so if we're stressed, the cells shut down, the fight or flight button goes off in the emotional brain, which is deep in our cognitive brain, the amygdala, that clicks. So the immune system is shut down. The frontal lobe, which houses all our higher brain functions, that shuts down and all the blood rushes to the to, to the muscles then to fight or fight as if we were little cavemen it literally goes back to that gut instinct so this is a very important um gut brain axis telephone wire if you like i always explain to three-year-olds you know if you imagine your first brain on the phone to your second brain just having a little check-in saying you're all right and then they get the feedback so when i go in with touch or whatever therapy it is i'm using um, because you're going in on that cellular level, four to six treatments, you're beginning to reprogram those cells with positivity, being able to cope, being able to function, aggression levels dipping, you know, aggression lowering, anger subsiding. You begin to melt boundaries and that's when you get to the jewels, the, the, what I call your golden nuggets that are deep in you. Once you peel back those layers and earn the trust and trust has been proven for 60 years scientifically to boost um, trust, bonding, emotional intelligence. Um, goodness me, there's so much to it. it um, social intelligence. You know, there's even areas on the head when you just shampoo your own head or push your hands up your hair and squeeze. That's a really delicious one you can do on yourselves. I love that one. I get goose pimples down my neck when I do that one. When you work on that, you're working on the path of dopamine, motivation, pleasure, and um, focus concentration. So you, you imagine these kids, I see them four to six times, but I give them a little bit of homework, not homework, I'm only teasing, it's never homework, little top-ups that they can do for themselves or as a family, anything like that, even tapping their heads, because some kids like tapping, don't they? Get them to tap their heads. That really boosts, obviously not with epilepsy, that last one, but that what you're doing is, because our heads are like a beautiful neuropsychological map of who we are, you know, we've got areas for sensory processing, reading and processing faces, empathy, social cognition, sensory processing, um, confidence, compassion. It's amazing to think we've actually got parts of our brain for those things. So when you're massaging that, you're boosting all of that. And again, it's these messages going in on that cellular level and on a water level, water carrying memory too. And when all these experiments have been done over 50, 60 years, beginning with Harry Harlow, and you've now got um, top professors like Michael Mead and Deborah Francis, Tiffany Field, all proving that touch not only boosts immunity, resilience to stress, goes in on this cellular level, boosts the the whole endocrine system all these happy hormones and coping chemicals and emotional intelligence proves all of this these were on animals these were on monkeys rats and mice which i know doesn't sound very nice tiffany works with people i 
with this. But it's proven again and again that even on, without being rude, the level of a rat, when rats were touched, they had better social skills, better trust, better bonding. But get ready for this. They had better physical growth, uh, more resilience to stress, as I've said. But get ready for this. They all had bigger brains. Now, IQ, what got me onto this, Lucy, was you mentioning mm -hmm. about the IQ and the brain. You're meant to be able, when I did all my training, well, I haven't done all my training. I'm always training every day. Um, what I meant was on the courses I've been on, we were taught you can grow emotional intelligence and you can grow and learn social intelligence, but you can't grow IQ. And I'm with you on this one. And I, I mean, it's been proven in rats, mice and monkeys that the brains were bigger. But I honestly believe when you are working on that cellular level and you are building the emotional intelligence and social intelligence, the cognitive brain can reach its full potential. And that's why these kids need it. You know, they need that. And, it, and it's not even just autistic children, you know, touch has become so taboo and especially now with corona even more so <clears throat> but there's all different therapies you can use to stimulate don't even need to use touch you know there's other ways as i said before mindfulness meditation it's known to boost focus boost concentration fire up the happy hormones so if you've got somebody who doesn't like touch there's all different ways that you can access that child you know, it's an invitation. When, when you work with anybody, be it a child or an adult, it's an invitation. And then you listen from the heart. It's a deeper listening. So in other words, you feel their words. You feel their words on a human level. And then you, you blend all of that with your knowledge and training, you know, or, or what I share on a family and friends basis. And you meet that each unique person where they are it's not magic it's you know this is how I work with everybody and you know I've gone on to see people do amazing things go on and do trampolining for Britain you know in competitions I've seen them you know non-verbal um I'm thinking of one now a non-verbal young lady I worked with 22 and she's gone on to dance that is and, and when she dances it's, it's like almost like her body is liquid it, it's like watching a ribbon in the wind she, she's phenomenal it makes me cry everything makes me cry even though I've tried to teach myself not to but you know there's so many different ways and um and it's just if you can provide that environment and it's not hard you know, when I used to go in on inset days for Ollie, I would say to him, you know, there's little things you can tweak. For instance, Ollie had trouble. I'm, I'm going on one. I'm so sorry. I just love what I do and I love my journey. Interrupt me if you need to. But I, I would go in um, on inset days and as well as giving them a photograph of Ollie and about Ollie, because I, I know, and this is no disrespect to teachers, they are under such crippling pressure they do not always have time to read EHCPs, just to let you know. And I know this because my sister's a Senko and my mum worked with um, children with different abilities. I don't like saying special needs. Um, they don't always have time to supply teachers, definitely don't. So a little postcard in a register is handy. Um, I've not completely lost my thread now. Oh yes, that was it. And I'd also give practical tips so the way i approach schools was on a very positive please let me work with you way rather than you're doing this wrong you're doing that wrong i i approached them because i was like water on a stone i mean my son's college had 1500 students in it but i would ring up and they'd say oh hello juliana <laughs> before i'd even said who i was i must have been a nightmare anyway um what i used to do was say to the school you know, Ollie has trouble, this is just one example, understanding and processing multiple instructions. But because for me, very quickly, my journey became a fight for all these children, all of these children. Ollie's been given to me as a blessing, as a teacher. And so now it's, it's you know, I've realised just 
how horrendous it is for parents and families out there. So I would go in and say, right, this is just one thing. Um, he has trouble understanding multiple instructions. But rather than just break it down and go, well, this is for the autistic child in the corner called Oliver. Um, there might be dyslexic children who have trouble understanding multiple instructions. There could be a child going through mental health issues, problems at home. They haven't slept all night. If you broke down the instructions on a whiteboard, you are including my son, but in a very discreet way that benefits the whole class. So I've always approached schools with practical things that they can do that don't make that child feel like they're standing out. So I hope that helps. Juliana, would you mind, um, what about, say, adults that have got very low self-esteem? What sort of exercises okay. would you do, especially now with what's happening with lockdown and yes. all the rest of it, just really affecting their mental health and their self-esteem is rock bottom. So what yes. sort of tips would you have that could we could possibly do with them that they wouldn't see as patronising as well? Because we've got to be very exactly. careful with our adults. Exactly. So self-esteem, that's a big one. It's huge. Um, temples, again, really, really good. And I just use my... You have to put oil fingers. on your fingers or... You can do. Any oils? Yeah. You can do. Be careful, though, because... Um, and I, I didn't even... When I did all my aromatherapy training, um, back then they didn't realise that lavender could trigger fits, epileptic right. fits. So if anybody's had um, any kind of... Even just one fit, I never use lavender. But okay. chamomile and rosewood are really, really safe. Rosewood is like a cuddle in a bottle. Chamomile is very calming. Rose geranium is a great uplifter. Anything, um, mandarin is another one. Uh, bergamot is a really lovely um, uplifter. Um, rose geranium, don't use if you have high blood pressure though. But you can do it dry or just with an oil with no smell because for some autistic people, they don't like really strong smells. So I'm mm -hmm. always guided by them. But if you get your three middle fingers or two and you just rotate your temples, that's really powerful because you're surging the body with um, all the happy hormones, particularly serotonin, the happiness and confidence one. Um, a lot of self-esteem comes from anxiety too. So if you massage, I don't know if you can see, if the deepest bit of your palm there, that's a really fantastic one because you're working on the gut. Yeah, yeah circular yeah. movement when you work there on the on the palm you're working on the gut can you believe it so that's the second brain so again it's where we store that, that real fear that dread that that squashed feeling that small feeling the other so thing you matter if you're doing it clockwise laurie's asking or, or oh no not doesn't matter which way right okay go anti-clockwise which probably means something really sinister but no right like, you can do it either, any way you want um, you know whatever comes naturally to you the other thing you can do is push your if you push your hands up your neck where you've got that bony ridge which is basically it's the occipital ridge but in human terms it's it's where the bottom of the skull meets the top of the neck and if you push your fingers up your neck you'll easily find it and mm -hmm. it just pokes out a little bit and you can just massage your fingers along there because what you're doing either side of, you know the little hollow bit in your neck? Yeah, yeah. Hollow bit there. Either side of there is where something called the vagus nerve begins. And that's like the, the um, that's the telephone wire between the first brain and the second brain in the gut. That's where it all happens. And what that does, it pushes the, because 90% of our happy hormone is actually in our gut. So when you work, that's that why else anything you do on the face and when you work there, jaw squeezes anything like this anything at all on the face when you're working on the gut you're pushing up that serotonin from the gut up the cerebral spine, spinal fluid and flooding the brain so that's another way how long do you do it for do you have to do it for like five minutes ten minutes or doesn't it matter five minutes a day even or ten minutes when you get up in the morning ten minutes when you go to bed and don't forget once you've repeated this five to six times that mm -hmm. memory of dropping out of fight or flight because also along that ridge when you're massaging along that ridge you've got still points and that lowers heart rate and blood pressure stabilizes it helps you sleep and obviously if you sleep you wake up feeling better about things more able to cope and function so any of those tips you could do on yourselves you could do on each other and that will all hugely boost 
serotonin, the hormone of happiness, self-esteem and confidence. Thank you. Eileen's got a question. Um, yeah. Um, Emma, my daughter, when she's in a particularly anxious state or if she's in, in a meltdown, doesn't like to be touched. But one no. thing that she does like when she's sort of coming down a little bit is she loves to have her feet massaged and her toes squeezed and massaged. I just okay. wonder, is there anything I can use oil-wise or and what, what would that do to her? What is that doing, the feet okay. massaged? It, does she have epilepsy? No. No, okay. So you could use a beautiful blend, a really gorgeous blend that I love to use with very anxious people or people who have been in that huge meltdown is lavender. Um, and I put it into hand cream. I don't actually use oil because it can, I don't, a lot of people don't like to feel greasy. I will if they want it, skin on skin, but some people, most of the time I'm doing it through clothes. Just a little bit of hand cream, no scent to it. A little drop of lavender, a little drop of chamomile and go for chamomile Morocco. It does exactly the same as ca Roman chamomile, but it's about a sixth of the price. Okay and rosewood and rosewood is like a cuddle in a bottle and the reason your daughter likes having her toes squeezed is because the big toe for a start is the head so what she wants to do is to feel brought back into her body because her head is a million miles an hour in that meltdown so the lavender and chamomile will drop a, what you call drop the energy down and the rosewood is giving her that nurture because she would have been in huge trauma fight or flight when she's having that meltdown you know, and if she wants a toe squeeze, do it. And another thing you can do is squeeze the fingers. The other thing I tend to do if I know somebody's not going to let me anywhere near them, because, I mean, I've literally had children, and this is appalling, I've had children with, uh, the teachers had their jumper in a ball in their hand, and they've not pushed, but, well, a little bit pushed, you know, I don't want to be rude, shoved the child into my therapy room and said, this is Mr. So-and-so. Um, he's a behavioural. No child, want, no one wants to be introduced like that. No one does. So if that child is in a screaming meltdown, I start to breathe really, really deeply through my nose and out through my mouth. And then I start to just, I'll stand up a little bit because I'm only little. Hang on a minute. I start to squeeze my arms down like this. And then I go on that anxiety point I was talking about before which also relates to the gut and starts to push the serotonin and dopamine up from the gut. Um, and what I find is because I'm breathing so deeply and I'm not asking them questions when they just don't want to talk, that's fair enough. Everybody should respect each other's space. I find that the whole atmosphere in the room drops, particularly if I'm using these oils too, the atmosphere in the room will drop and they'll start to mirror me. They will start to mirror me. You know, I, I do lots of things like that. There, there's different yoga positions you can do. I can't really climb on a beanbag and show you now. But on my um, YouTube video, I've actually, um, YouTube channel, Rainbow Kids Touch Therapy. And it's not just for kids, it's for, it's for any age. There's another one you could do, because meltdowns come from the gut. Um, if you lie down on your back, it's called happy baby pose. And you, you wrap your arms around your knees, but your knees are... Like, like babies lie on their backs and hug their knees. Mm. I'm, I'm having to describe it because A, I'm wearing a dress and it would be a bit inappropriate, but two, you can't, <laughs> you can't see. And you just, it's called, I call it the rock and roll. And you just rock from side to side like that. And what you're doing is massaging the gut. So that actually pushes, again, it, it, it eases the rage and that fight or flight, you know, that awful, like, like, slamming on the alarms you know it drops them from that and it drops you from that too because obviously when you see your daughter in distress you're going to feel it as a mum I mean I know I do with all my Ollie and you just I call it the rock and roll I say all right let's do a bit of rock and roll so I'll lie down on the floor which a lot of people think is outrageous and I'll just do that and they'll mirror me you know so there's all different ways that you can access you know put on some really lo lovely gentle music if they can stand it you know because sound is another really powerful powerful there's different notes that relate to the heart for instance the gut the brain um the, the 
sound is, is incredibly powerful. So if you've got somebody who is, doesn't want to be touched, there's all these different ways around it, all these different ways around it. Thank you. So I'm, I've waffled on again because I love what I do so much and I just want to share so much and the time is limited. I'm kind of going, <laughs> but you're very free to email me or contact me and I, or have a little chat with you. It's no problem at all. Sadly, time is limited. We've, we've only got a few minutes left. So does anyone have any more questions? I've shared your YouTube link and your website details in the chat group chat and Laurie's oh, already oh, thank you Tell. yeah Laurie's thank already she's, she's loving she's actually been working along with you so she's oh been... yay I love it <laughs> so, so it's been, I don't know if there's any more um, uh, questions here but please if you've got a, a last tip or something that you'd like to share you've still got a uh, a, a little bit of time and then we can then we can break yes and just to remind everyone as well that um you know there's articles that juliana is writing for us every week so if you check out the charity website they usually appear tuesday or wednesday of every week with um a topic that juliana would like to share and obviously her youtube so it's always going to be on there and we're really grateful that juliana is writing for us so it's fantastic oh, thank you it's a, honestly it's such a joy i love it you know it's all, we're in it together aren't we you know and when when um, lockdown happened I was petrified at first because obviously as a therapist I, I was only allowed to begin work this week <laughs> so it's been a bit interesting you know so I thought well why should I still not share you know if I'm going to go down I'm going to go down sharing you know there's all these people we're all in it together and it's just a joy to me to share but I'll show you one more thing and this is quite good and and anybody can do it because again I'm thinking of all ages all abilities if you I've got to tuck my hair behind my ears I've only got little ears but if you just twiddle your ears and I know this sounds really weird but if you just twiddle your ears so in other words just gently pull and stretch them a little bit obviously not so your eyes water but just gently the ears if you imagine they look like little babies don't they and they're like microcosms of who we are of our little of our bodies so when you work on the ears, you are actually working on the entire body. So you've got the back, you've got, if, it, if they're non-verbal, you've got the tongue and the, and the mouth all in the bottom here. But even if you don't know what all the different points of the ears are, you're doing several at once because our fingers are quite big compared to our ears. So just by pulling and stretching our ears, you're actually, you're actually accessing every single major organ of the body. So once again, you're talking about the stomach, the gut, the serotonin, the happy hormones, the coping chemicals. So it's like going to the gym and doing an absolutely gigantic workout, you know, without, like, if you're anything like me, feeling a bit, you know, oh my God, there's all these body beautifuls. And once I put my knickers on outside of my trousers, I shouldn't really say this on here, but anyway, <laughs> it removes all of that humiliation. <laughs> so it's a whole body workout, everybody. Oh, brilliant. Laurie's already given herself a full body massage with oils. Yes! That's what I love to hear. <laughs> Look, she's got her oils. <laughs> <laughs> it's like reflexology, isn't it? It's uh, Very much. Reflex All these therapies talk to each other. Yeah. And that's why when anybody comes to see me, even I don't know what they're going to get because I need to feel them. Listen from the heart, that slower listening hear what they're not saying because bodies communicate a lot and words can hide a lot so it's feeling feeling them so i can meet them where they're at and then from there it's a flow and an invitation so i might do some touch i might do some yoga i might do some sound i might blend some sound into a beautiful sensory meditation you know i flow with them so it's all these therapies talk to each other and and that's the big message i wanted to get across during lockdown unfortunately in in my world a lot of therapists are very guarded and not a lot some most therapists i know are really humble and really gorgeous but there are some who want to almost you know this is mine and and you have to pay me and which is fair enough because we've all got to live you know god isn't chucking bread rolls at our heads as we walk along the road but um well, he probably wants to throw a few things at mine. <laughs> but, um, I, I just think... Picturing you know, that. 
because our therapies all, you know, we're all coming from the same place. We should share. We, and I will never stop sharing. Even when this corona is all over, I'm never going to stop sharing because there's so many people I can't get to. And so many other therapists are now are beginning to do this too. And, and we're all kind of fl flying each other's flags and keep pointing children in each other's directions. And, and it's a bit like this work we're doing here today to help all ages, all abilities, you know, all families, all budgets. We can only do this from this sort of platform and share freely. And it is so needed. And the parents and the, and the, you know, like the kids who are, you know, like we, um, the lady in the beginning was saying they drop off the cliff at 25 or 16. You know, we need to be that core support after this is finished. They, they need to know how to access us. The families need to know how to have that support. You're not on your own. The isolation surrounding autism is dreadful for the families as well as the person. So I'm here for you all. And I know all of you are there for everybody. So you know just contact me if you want to know anything after this contact me thank you it's so all free <laughs>